We're here today with Tom Whitmore of uh, MUFON, uh, and we're here to ask him basically, first of all, if disclosure is now underway considering the release of those gun turret photos of a UFO by, by jet fighter planes and other statements that seemingly are coming from inside the military that uh, they've recovered UFO debris and it's material not of this earth. So, Tom, what do you think of this? Is this what's going on here? Is this some kind of a PR stunt or is disclosure actually beginning? What do you make of it? Because it's a reversal of what the government's been poo-pooing all these years. Yes, uh, Larry, I think that what has been happening has been a, a fairly complicated process and it's been going on over a pretty long period of time. Uh, there is a group of people, uh, some longtime UFO researchers and people that have worked in the military and the government and that have been government contractors that have been dissatisfied with the level or lack of any information coming out from the government about the UFO problem. And some of these people have worked together to try to find ways to get information out to the public without breaking any laws. Now, particularly, uh, this group is TTSA to the STARS Academy, and the key people that I think are involved in this are Luis Elizondo mm -hmm. and Christopher Mellon. Now, Luis Elizondo has had a background in the military and in the DOD, and so has Christopher Mellon. Christopher Mellon is a very highly qualified person that has worked in both the congressional level and at the DOD level. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, I think what has been happening is there has been a long-term policy in the military to not report uh, UFO sightings. Right. Uh, I think we've heard uh, rumors for years and stories for years that, that uh, jet pilots, uh, Air Force pilots, know better than to report their sightings. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't help their career. And this has also been going on in the Navy. Now, apparently, what's been happening in the Navy is they have had really significant UFO incidents, uh, one or more or even uh, several or even dozens of UFOs uh, flying around during uh, uh, military uh, uh, aircraft operations. And I think that Luis Elizondo, in being involved in the so-called ATIP program, was trying to find a way, along with Tom DeLong and Chris Mellon and other people involved with TTSA, They've been trying to find a way to get this out to the public. Now, what I think Elizondo did was he applied for the release of two or three of these videos that we've all seen, both on TV and in the New York Times. Mm -hmm. And he applied mm -hmm. to get these released, but he got them released based on that they were drones. Now, the, pro the thing about that is I believe that the form it, he filled out, it didn't have a checkbox for UFO but it did have a checkbox for drones. So these videos were brought out along with the uh, introduction of TTSA to the public, and this started uh, this trend of, of articles in the New York Times and of Louis Elizondo and Tom DeLong, uh, particularly going on major media and making statements. Now, right, so, so Tom, so Tom then, then Elizondo and DeLong uh, kind of use deception to get the, the documents released by checking them, checking off the box for drones rather than UFOs. Is that what you're saying? Yes, that's my understanding. And why, why are they being allowed to continue, though, now that it's been uh, released? I mean, uh, wouldn't the military or the Pentagon or the insiders who's ever controlling the information take steps now to nip this in the bud before it goes any further? Why are they allowing them to, uh, to uh, speak freely to the media. Well, the the cat is out the bag out of the bag for one thing, and Louis Elizondo is no longer employed mm -hmm. uh, by the Department of Defense, even though presumably he's still subject to whatever non disclosure agreements he right. has, and, and with Christopher Mellon. So, what I think is going on is the cat the cat has been let out of the bag. Now then, other UFO researchers and investigators started uh, filing FOIA requests. And at that point, we started getting conflicting information coming out of the Department of Defense. 
Now, there is, uh, there is a notion that I believe is probably true, that there is, a, there is a faction in the Department of Defense and in the military of conservative Christians who believe that the UFO problem is demonic in origin, mm -hmm. and they do not want the UFO problem discussed. So I think internally in the Department of Defense, there has been pushback against this whole trend of uh, providing at least some information about the UFO problem. So UFO researchers have been filing FOIA requests, and they have basically had to drag answers out of the Department of Defense and and some of those answers have been contradictory. So where, where, where do you think this is all leading to now? Are we going to be getting more and more information and disclosure and uh, reach a point where the public is now convinced that officials are, are confirming that UFOs uh, are real and intelligently controlled? I think what has been accomplished at this point, Larry, has been what I would term soft disclosure. And that is that there has been uh, uh, there has been the idea put out into the public in major media like the New York Times that that UFOs are real, but that does not constitute what I consider to be hard disclose, hard confirmation, mm -hmm. or hard disclosure. And what I mean by that is hard confirmation is the Secretary of Defense or the Assistant Secretary of Defense holding a news conference putting up pictures of these UFOs and saying that they're real. That, in my mind, is hard confirmation. We, can't, we are not getting that. Is it coming? I, I doubt it. I doubt it. Because if you carefully read the latest article from the New York Times uh, put out by, that was authored by Ralph Blumenthal and Leslie Keene, they they had uh, a couple of statements made by Eric Davis, who is a private citizen, and also by Harry Reid, former uh, Senate Majority Leader. Eric Davis is the only person so far that has gone on the record that the, that the U.S. government has recovered UFOs, but he is not speaking in an, in an official capacity. Hmm. He's speaking as a private citizen. And then Harry Reid, uh, supposedly made this statement and then backtracked and repudiated his statement. So we have not received any official confirmation that the government has recovered uh, UFOs. Well, you know, Tom, it even amazes me that the media is now taking this more seriously. I mean, usually, you know, they, they would ridicule it, they'd make jokes about it and all that. There's, there's been a, a significant change of tone. Now, the CIA has admitted decades ago that they have media assets, that they have key people in the media that they're able to use to control stories. So why is that changing now? The New York Times, the Washington Post, others actually seeming to give the, these stories much more credibility than previously. Why, why are they uh, doing this? It's interesting because, uh, as you know, I'm involved with MUFON. I've been with MUFON for many years. Right. And at a previous MUFON symposium, uh, actually many years ago, I saw Leslie Keene, one of the authors of this New York Times article, mm -hmm. I saw Leslie Keene Keen give a presentation about her work in uh, trying to turn up more information about this problem. And she mentioned John Podesta. Now, mm -hmm. I think that there is a, a group of influential and semi-influential people that have enough clout to get a story into the New York Times. And the way that I, now I'm not a media person, you're much more qualified to, to uh, talk about this than I am, but I think that the way that it works is that once a major media outlet comes out with a serious story, such as the New York Times has done, then the, re the rest of the media falls into line and they start paying attention to it. Yeah, uh, so, what do you make of this in terms of the reality of UFOs? What are they doing here to begin with? It's possible, Larry, that the UFOs, wherever they come from, whether they're extraterrestrial or interdimensional or time travel or are coming from somewhere within the Earth system, uh, that it's, it's highly possible that it's been going on for a very long time. Uh, possibly thousands of years, even 10,000 
tens of thousands of years. So that, that's one of the big questions in the mystery. Um, people have reported uh, close encounters with UFOs in which they've landed it and seen occupants yeah. or even had interaction with the occupants. We've had many, many reports by individuals who have undergone what we call abduction experiences or experiences. Right. So what we have to do, uh, I think we at MUFON and other people that are involved in UFO investigation and researches, we have to try to take all these bits of information and put them in together into a picture. Now, one of the most convenient theories is that the UFOs and their occupants are extraterrestrial in origin. And that seems almost like a common sense notion, but, but unless there's information within the government and someone within authority can verify that and confirm it, even that, the extraterrestrial hypothesis, is just a theory. Well, you know, l l let me ask you this now, you know, pursuant to that point, is there any possibility that this technology is something that we possess through reverse engineering from a crash UFO or whatever? I mean, it, you know, it, it's beyond, it, it, the propulsion systems, if accurately reported, are beyond anything that uh, is at least publicly disclosed. It, you know, it seemed to be operating on anti-gravity or some, something like that, so, so something that, that's really out of the uh, mainstream uh, physics, or at least what we know about it. So uh, do you subscribe to any of that possibility that this has been retro-engineered by us or that we developed it on our own, that kind of technology? It's potentially the case. Again, I'm not going to say that they have that capability when I don't have any supporting evidence or proof mm -hmm. uh, to back that up. But there have been rumors for many, many years, uh, going back to the time in 1947 and the famous Roswell case right. and the alleged re recovery and that the the saucer and even the bodies were taken to Wright-Patterson or, or Los Alamos and different locations and then uh, began to be studied by, uh, you know, scientists and engineers, and they tried to back-engineer this. Now, there, there are two basic lines of rumor along this whole subject. One is that they've made very little, if any, progress. Uh, even uh, uh, Richard Doty has stated that uh, every four or five years, they bring in a new crew to take a look at, at the equipment that they have and see if they can they can make any any progress and maybe some progress is being made as our own technology advances. Mm -hmm. The other school of thought is that they they did figure it out and they do have the capability and that some of the objects that we're seeing in the sky now, you know, these triangular craft and other craft, are based on some kind of anti gravity technology that that the uh, that has been developed in secrecy. So there there are basically two schools of thought there. Yeah, uh, yeah. getting into uh, the um, Majestic 12 uh, situation, which I, I know you've researched thoroughly, but that's your specialty. Uh, there, were, there was some dissent uh, by Stanton Friedman and others originally that uh, the Majestic 12 documents were actually bogus. I think Friedman, correct me if I'm wrong, he changed his stance uh, eventually and said that they were real. Uh, what is your take on that? Is there any possibility that that, uh, that they were bogus, they, they, they were faked? Yes, that's a distinct possibility. And it, it really is a long story. And I want to go back a little bit in time to provide something of an explanation. When the original set of MJ-12 documents came out uh, publicly in 1987. They, they consisted of the so-called Eisenhower briefing document and the Truman Forrestal memorandum and subsequently the Cutler Twining memo. Tom, let me interrupt you there. I, I should have set this up uh, before we got into this. What, what was uh, MJ-12 essentially? What was it purported to be? Basic definition of it. For those MJ who may not be familiar with it. The MJ-12 is an alleged secret committee that was set up or authorized by President Truman in 1947 as a, as a result of the Ros Roswell UFO recovery. Uh -huh. And it comprised 
12 individuals who were top military generals, top scientists and engineers, and a couple of government people. And their, their mission, their charter, was to study the recovered material from the Roswell crash and allegedly, supposedly, to continue to track the UFO uh, problem and even manage public perception concerning right. it. Right. So do, do you think the documents are genuine or it's still open to question? The original set of documents that I just mentioned, the Eisenhower briefing document and the two others, uh, there are a lot of problems with them. In fact, there are so many problems that it's, it's likely that the documents are not genuine. Now, having said that, that's not to say that they might contain some important information. For example, it's, it's, it's conceivable that the list of people in the Eisenhower briefing document is, is true. Though those were people that were on the, on the committee, but the actual document itself is either altered or it's created uh, for the purposes of creating the impression that this material is true without right. the document being actually genuine. So where does, that, where does that leave you then with all the research you've done on this and how much of that information is at all useful since the authenticity, at least in part, is in doubt? What fascinates me Larry is I've always been interested in history and I've been reading stacks of history books since I was about 12 years old and eventually uh, I became interested in, in intelligence and espionage and at, at the time that I got interested uh, or that I became active in the UFO field which is the early 90s I had already developed this interest in, in intelligence work and espionage and when I got, when I saw the MJ-12 documents, the first impression of, that I had was maybe it was a coded message and it had something to do with uh, the Soviet KGB or the CIA or something like that. Yeah. Now, there, there really is a lot to the MJ-12 uh, studies issue, and let me tell you why. The MJ-12 documents first appeared around 1983, 1984. Later in that decade, we had a program, by the, there was a program, a documentary on TV called UFO Cover-Up Live, in which many of the same allegations were made. Then in the late 80s, we got the allegations or the claims by Bob Lazar uh, yeah. out of Air 51. Then uh, we started getting a whole new set of MJ-12 documents through a a uh, UFO researcher by the name of Timothy Cooper. Then in that same decade, we got another MJ-12 related document known as Som the Psalm 01-1 manual, which was allegedly a manual for recovery of UFOs. Right. Then uh, we had other claims by a person going by the name of Dan Burrish, who claimed that he was uh, a government scientist who helped uh, uh, NET with his medical problems. Mm -hmm. Then, in addition to that, we've gotten the Serpo story, which is a whole story that came out on the set of uh, internet uh, editions with, that described a, an exchange program between the Earth and this, the Zeta Reticuli mm -hmm. ETs. And then, as late as 2017, we've received still another document on the internet, which I call the Ultra Top Secret document. So what I'm getting at, Larry, is this has been going on since the 80s. And why have these documents continued to come out? Most of them uh, have been spurious in one way or another, uh, which, of course, provides plausible deniability. But a lot of these documents have also provided a lot of interesting information. So the question is, who is creating these documents and why? Well, for instance, uh, Bob Lazar. Do you find him credible? Yes and no. I, no I first, first of all, Bob Lazar was the guy who supposedly uh, worked at Area 51 and saw recovered alien spacecraft and bodies, correct? Yes. Well, okay. he, he claims that he briefly worked at Area S4 
at Area 51 uh, working on reverse engineering uh, of saucers there, and that they, he saw several uh, uh, craft there. Right. Uh, he, he's been he's been big uh, with with uh, people that are enthusiastic about this area, and a lot of people give him uh, much credibility. What about you? I I say yes and no. I I find him credible in that he's been very calm and very steady in the stories and the claims that he's made over the years, and I think that his claims have been uh, that his story has remained pretty consistent over a long period of time. On the no side, his uh, his claimed academic credentials don't check out, and he ha he has a rather checkered, uh, kind of questionable past. Well, Tom, this leads me to the question: What do you yourself personally believe about UFOs? Uh, UFOs meaning intelligently uh, controlled craft uh, of another uh, planet or from somewhere beyond the Earth. Uh, are you convinced of that, or is that an open question for you as well? No, I'm convinced that UFOs are real. And like I said, it's, it seems like common sense that they would be extraterrestrial in origin, but a lot of really serious UFO researchers have put up other theories about that. Mm -hmm. But yes, I, be I personally believe, and I'll definitively state, that the UFO phenomenon is real and it deserves serious, serious study. Okay, but based on, on what though, since you've already noted uh, a number of uh, bogus claims, uh, specious uh, documents, et cetera, et cetera, so what has so convinced you, putting the, putting the stuff aside that, that isn't uh, credible, what makes you convinced that they are real? You know, what is the evidence that has convinced you that yes, indeed, they are real? The, the evidence is that over uh, a long period of time since the uh, modern UFO era began in 1947, that there have, for one thing, there have been far too many credible sightings for them to be dismissed. Secondly, there have been far too many credible close encounter reports that have been recorded by such uh, famous persons as, as Dr. J. Allen Hynek, and, and Jacques Vallée and other serious researchers. There, in addition to that, there have been too many reports of serious close encounters in which occupants have been observed. And also, there have been far too many reports of abductions in which abductees have described the appearance of these entities. They've described the appearance of the inside of the craft and other activities that have occurred inside the craft. So there, to make a long story short, there's just been way, way, way too much uh, evidence for this to, to just be cast aside and discarded. Now, I do admit what we don't have is firm, hard confirmation from the government side. But you think they may have that, but they're keeping it to themselves. I think if they do have it, they have their reasons for keeping it. Tom, uh, in terms of credibility, which always impressed me about credible sightings over the years, is uh, sightings that were uh, registered simultaneously, visually, by pilots, uh, police officers, other credible witnesses, and on radar at the same time. Are those the types of credible sightings instances that you're talking about? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, you're talking about not only common citizens, but... Uh, like you mentioned, police officers, airline pilots, military pilots, air traffic controllers, radar controllers. I mean, the list goes on and on. In terms of alien abductions, uh, I've interviewed Dr. Uh, David M. Jacobs, who's uh, written a number of books and is recognized in that field. Uh, he has uh, regressed uh, alleged abductees. You know, he's convinced that uh, alien abductions are occurring and have been occurring for some time. What is your reading on Dr. Jacobs' work? I think Dr. Jacobs has done some very important work, and I think that he has done a large quantity of interviews and hypnosis sessions with uh, with people that have claimed to be uh, having abduction experiences. And I think because of the, the quantity 
over the period of time of work that he's done that I think that his his body of work uh, deserves very careful uh, analysis and scrutiny, and I, I feel that it has, in my mind, a fair amount of credibility. Dr. Jacobs is convinced that whatever they're up to will not be good for humanity. It's not benevolence, it's malevolence. What's your view? I think that we need to remember that assuming that this phenomenon is occurring the way that we believe that it does, or that it is, that there are at at a minimum, several groups involved in this. And uh, one or more of the groups appear to be friendly and benign, and one or more of the, of the groups appear to be not so, not so friendly and not so benign. And I think it's also, uh, it's, it's feasible that there, there are groups that are neutral. So I think it's a mixed bag. It depends on the abductees stories. Some of the abductees start out being very frightened by their experiences and end up having a very positive feeling about the whole the whole sequence. Other abductees undergo terrifying experiments or experiences and, and this is this is uh, frightening. So when, when you consider uh, uh, the possibility that you have these little gray alien guys, and taller grays and human looking aliens that look like Nordics from Scandinavia and even reptilians and even insect like beings like a praying mantis. Uh, we're dealing with uh, a situation where we apparently have a number of different groups. And dealing. is it your belief that the government is aware of this and they are actually engaging with them, such as exchange programs, things like that? If the rumors are true, yes. And some of the MJ-12 type documents point to some of these things. But again, like I said, most of the MJ-12 related documents are questionable. They're what I call question documents. Uh, and there have been these allegations made, for example, on the UFO cover-up live program in 1988. And this is where supposedly Falcon and, and Condor spilled the beans, saying that the government had knowledge of all this, had communication with the aliens, had alien technology, et cetera, et cetera. So it depends on whether you want to believe the rumors or not. In, in the notes uh, you provided me before this interview, you mentioned that um, there have been stories of USO, UFO crash retrievals and government agency involvements in the UFO community? In other words, infiltration by the government into groups such as yours? Yes, and this goes back, well, actually it goes back before the 1980s, uh, because in the 1950s, you had a certain amount of concern uh, at the top government levels about the Cold War, and they were concerned that the Soviets might take advantage of UFO hysteria to somehow jam the communication lines uh, in case of a Soviet attack or, mm -hmm. or a nuclear war. And so the CIA and the so-called Psychological Strategy Board uh, and, and in conjunction with the Robertson panel, they were conducting a policy of monitoring the UFO groups. Now this goes all the way back to the 50s and 60s and NICAP, the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, was very involved uh, in pushing for uh, uh, congressional hearings. They even had a couple of people on their board that were from the CIA. So there was that aspect of it. But in the 1980s, what, what was learned in the UFO community from a confession that Bill Moore made at the 1989 MUFON Symposium was that Bill Moore, who at the time was a very prominent UFO researcher and investigator, a very competent one, at the time that he had been recruited uh, by a mysterious person going by the code name of Falcon, uh, and he had been recruited by Falcon and was in liaison through the Air Force Office of Special Investigations, mm -hmm. namely through Richard Doty, who was a special agent with the Air Force Office of Special Investigations, and that Moore had been recruited to report 
on activities of individual UFO researchers and UFO groups. And after he uh, gave his talk at the 1989, <clears throat> excuse me, MUFON Symposium in Las Vegas, Nevada, after that, the UFO community was never the same. And many people in the UFO community have believed that the UFO community is infiltrated. So therefore, uh, the government infiltration is suppressing further disclosure, muddying the waters, uh, spreading false reports to make it difficult to ascertain what's real and what isn't? Is that what they're doing? It's possible because if you see uh, an advanced aircraft, a classified aircraft, which seems to be unlikely because you wouldn't think that they would run those outside of the purview of, say, Area 51. Right. But, but if you saw what is actually a classified aircraft, they might want to spread the idea that it was a UFO. And vice versa. If you had a legitimate, credible UFO sighting that the military or the intelligence agencies might be aware of, Mm -hmm. they might come out and try to make it look like it was an advanced aircraft. So yeah. I think it could it could occur in that sense. What do you make of the reports that uh, there have been uh, certain instances where UFOs hovered outside missile bases, military bases, and shut down the missiles and atomic weaponry? Uh, what do you think of that? Yeah, those reports are apparently very credible, and there has been a particular... Uh, UFO researcher that has documented those those claims uh, from uh, personnel that were in the missile silos or were at the military bases at the time that those events occurred. So I believe that the reports themselves are credible. Now, I think it remains to be seen if they were actually UFOs or if there might be some other explanation. For example, uh, there's reason to believe that the military has silent helicopters. Yeah. And most people don't know about this, but you get into a scenario where you're uh, capturing Osama bin Laden and they have something like a silent helicopter or something like that. So it's, it's not outside the realm of possibility that there could have been some kind of military exercise to see if, uh, if the security uh, was working there at the bases and so on and so forth. But those reports are credible. You know, what about the story that uh, the reason we never went back to the moon, even though we were first on the moon, we were had a great advantage in pursuing a lunar exploration bases, all that. Suddenly all that stopped because as kind of like a 2001 scenario, we were warned away from that. What do you make of that? That's at the rumor level. And, and again, I mean, it, anything is is conceivable, but people say that we didn't go back to the moon, but we had Apollo 11, I think, through Apollo 17. Mm -hmm. We went to the moon, you know, after we went there the first time, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin and yeah. company, uh, they went back over and over a number of times. So, uh, of course, now that program had to have been extremely expensive. And I think the government reached a point to where they, they just didn't want to fund that anymore. Maybe they felt like they learned as much as they were going to learn by actually going to the moon, moon and recovering rocks and, and taking scientific measurements. Now, uh, I have had the privilege as a member of the MUFON board to have a private meeting between an individual on the MUFON board and this individual claimed that he uh, was called into an NSA facility to repair a printer. And at the time that he was doing that in the early 60s, uh, there was a lot of concern in that building because they were getting photographs of a base on the on the far side of the moon. Now that's his testimony. So I, I try not to take a hard line on, on a lot of these questions because it's, it's, it's potentially there. It's potential that there is activity on the moon and maybe somehow that information has been suppressed from the public. 
Well, that, that kind of goes along the speculation that there's been a parallel space program all these years. NASA does something publicly, but we actually have uh, astronauts flying even to Mars and other planets at the same time. It's kind of like along those lines of speculation, is it not? Yes, definitely speculation. And those are some of those claims are just so outlandish. Yeah. It, it's difficult for me to believe them. But there has always been a secret space, uh, space program in that there has always been classified uh, work being done in space. For example, they, there are classified satellites, there's classified technology in orbit, and even they, they even publicly announced at a lot of these NASA launch launches that they're in the space shuttle, that they're carrying classified satellites. So, there has always been a secret aspect to the space program. Now, if people are going to Mars and all that, then they would have to have this kind of anti-gravity technology that we've been talking about. Yeah. Because uh, conventional chemical rocket technology, it just takes too long to right. get to Mars. And I don't, I don't see it as being feasible unless they have some really advanced technology that's way beyond anything that we're aware of. Yeah, the speed of light would seem to be a uh, limiting factor, even to get to the nearest uh, star outside of our own solar system. Uh, so is the thinking that the anti-gravity technology exceeds the speed of light, or the speed of light is outside of that technology, not relevant, uh, interdimensional travel? In other words, what kind of propulsion system would make interstellar, even intergalactic travel possible within a reasonable amount of time? I don't think we know that there are the theories that we all hear about in, in public, you know, wormholes and black holes and all this kind of thing. And, and unless they know something that we don't know, you know, at the, at the DARPA, in, in DARPA, um, unless they know something we don't know, I don't, it may be something that we haven't even thought of. For example, if we could go back to the time of Leonardo da Vinci, who was one of the true great geniuses of his time, and ask him, how could we do some of the things that we're doing now, he would have no idea. Yeah. And I, I think it's it's probable that if this if some kind of technology is being used for interstellar travel, that it could be something that we're not we, we're not anywhere close to understanding. Now your belief that UFOs exist, um does it necessarily include the uh, conviction that there are aliens inside, or are they robotic devices? Are they essentially uh, space drones, the probes that come to our planet? Or are, are they inhabited, controlled inside by aliens? Both are possible. The general drift of opinion about the UFO encounters that have been reported, uh, especially during the modern era since 1947, is that they're quote unquote manned, they're occupied by beings. But of, of course it's, it's a realizable uh, option that some of it could be remote controlled and, and drone uh, type equipment. Um, but uh, I, I really think that for whatever reason, these groups are doing what they're doing. Uh, they're here for their own purposes, and they're here to accomplish tasks that I don't think we understand yet. Is it a threat to humanity? Yes and no. Like I said, Larry, I think there are a number of different groups involved in this, and some of them are benign, some of them are malevolent, and some are neutral. So we may be at their mercy of those that are not uh, benevolent. No, no way of controlling that, no way of defending ourselves. That's right, and I liken it to the relationship that we have with animals. We have relationships with animals, but most all animals are essentially helpless against our power. Let me throw this out at you. Uh, you may have heard this story. That this was out years ago, decades ago that Werner von Braun uh, told his secretary that there'd be three stages of hoaxes to bring in control by a world government or something of that nature. The first hoax would be the uh, communist threat. 
The second one would be the terrorist threat. And the final one would be faking an alien invasion in order to unite all the nations of the world against the outside threat, and therefore you'd have a controlling world government. You've probably heard of that. What do you make of that? That is one person making a claim, and it's hearsay. We don't have any documentation to support that. We don't have any direct uh, testimony from Werner von Braun to that effect. So it's a matter of do we want to believe that person's claims or not. It seems to me, now I don't know exactly the year that this came out, but it seems to me that her claims came out after the terrorist problem arose. Mm. So in other words, you can you can construct that based on history. Now this idea that they have some kind of false flag or false alien invasion, that rumor has been running around for 20 years, mm -hmm. at least 20 years at a minimum. So if they were going to do something like that, I would think they would have done it by now, don't you? <laughs> Interesting question. Now, also, uh, alien, ancient alien programming on TV is you know, wi wildly uh, popular. Uh, do you think that there was interaction uh, throughout history, way back, you alluded to that before, in ancient times where aliens were interacting and perhaps controlling not only human civilization, but uh, bodily evolution of humans, such as 2001, where aliens came down and manipulated the genes to make a more intelligent ape. Uh, do you subscribe to anything along those lines? That notion began to come out in the 1980s. And it was connected with a lot of the rumors that were sweeping the UFO community at the time. There were documents that were coming out. One of the MJ-12 related documents is one that I refer to as the Carter briefing document. And in that paper, the assertion was made that the aliens crea created by implication Jesus Christ. And the, <clears throat> these notions that were being put out into the UFO public in the 80s and 90s were that the aliens had been involved in our evolution. They have directly right. uh, intervened in, uh, in the development of our evolution. And sometimes when we look back and we see what our capabilities are as humans and compare them with animals, it does seem to be a large gap. And also, I think it's, it's interesting to note that our written recorded history only goes back about maybe three, four, five thousand years at the most. So if we've, as human beings, if we've been around for, say, 200,000 years or a million years, there's a whole huge gap in history there that we don't even know about. Personally, I just try to keep an open mind. I don't take a hard line one way or the other. What about the story that uh, General Curtis LeMay, who was buddies with uh, conservative Republican Barry Goldwater, uh, supposedly told Goldwater, this is what Goldwater reportedly uh, reported himself, that he asked Curtis LeMay once about um, Roswell or whatever, and uh, he told him never to ask him about that again. Have you heard that story, and what do you make of it? Yes, I've heard that story. And that actually is documented from Barry Goldwater's side. And it's hard for me to think that there isn't something to that based on the fact that Gary, Barry Goldwater has testified that to that and that there's even a letter uh, of such. So that, in my mind, that tends to lend credibility to this whole idea that something had been recovered and was being kept somewhere like right now you know, Air Force Base or other locations. There have also been reports that, um, unsubstantiated, of course, that President Kennedy was uh, big on disclosure, and of course uh, that action was cut short by his assassination. Uh, any evidence that uh, Kennedy was thinking along those lines of disclosing information about UFOs? A lot of that comes from the so-called Marilyn Monroe document, mm -hmm. and that is a paper uh, that came out in the 90s. Um, some people have 
greatly questioned it. It comes from the idea that Marilyn Monroe was having an affair with John F. Kennedy and in Pillow Talk that John F. Kennedy told Marilyn Monroe right. that he had seen uh, this material and and presumably was interested in making the information public. But we don't really have anything more than that. Now, there's a very interesting question document called the Burn Memo, and it refers to Lancer, which was the code name for President Kennedy, and it refers to Lancer and a wet job. But the problem is we don't have any provenance. We have no chain of custody. We don't know where that document came from. Now, I know that uh, President Kennedy was interested in cooperating with the Soviets on the space program. Mm -hmm. And I've been check, checked into this at the National Archives myself. And you can see on my blog uh, the documentation that I've turned up on this. It's on my blog, tomwhitmoreblog.wordpress.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is documented evidence that President Kennedy was interested in cooperating with the Soviets uh, in the space program. And there is this conspiracy theory that the CIA wanted to bump, you know, that the military industrial complex wanted to bump him off because of that. Now, President Kennedy issued this memorandum, basically this order, uh, in, I believe, uh, October or November is in the fall of 1963, and he was assassinated shortly thereafter. So yeah. there wasn't a lot of follow-up after that on, on the governmental level. You know, Tom, I find you uh, an interesting person in, in terms that uh, you're not grasping at straws to uh, <clears throat> prove that UFOs uh, exist and all that. You, you know, you're sorting through what's credible, what's semi-credible, what's not credible. And also, now, your own background, you were a financial analyst, you know, pretty hard-headed with figures, analyzing things logically and all that. And um, apparently you bring that kind of a mindset, <clears throat> a mindset of logic, to your research uh, for, for MUFON. I try to. Um, my attitude about the MJ-12 subject is I'm trying to learn more. And whatever I learned, I'm going to let the chips fall where they where they may. Now, right now, Larry, I'm working on a paper uh, that I'm titling MJ-12, The Counterintelligence Angle. And the idea of that paper is that the MJ-12 documents that were received basically by Bill Moore and his research partners, that those documents were a reward for the work that Bill Moore did in... Uh, informing on UFO groups and UFO individuals. And the reason why certain parties within the government were interested in that is because they were, uh, they were um, engaging in a larger counterintelligence effort. This is during the Reagan era, that they were engaging in a larger counterintelligence effort to figure out how many Soviet spies there were in the United States. Yeah. Uh... Also, what I find interesting is that you move, you actually moved to uh, Silver Springs, Maryland to be close to the National Archives and the Library of Congress and other resources and reference sources in the Washington, D.C. area so you could further research that. Now, that, that's a very uh, serious commitment <clears throat> to uh, move on and to your research. What drives you to do this? I mean, this is apparently your serious, complex deep life mission. How come? It all goes back to the question of if. If there was a Roswell recovery, then it's only logical that some kind of special group probably was formed to study the recovered materials and the bodies. Now that effort may have taken the shape of MJ-12, an MJ-12 committee or something like it, or it may have just been run through the authorities in the Department of Defense matrix. But if that is true, then there, there is definitely government knowledge of the UFO reality with hard proof. Now, the MJ-12 documents, questionable as many of them may be, point toward that possibility. You know, uh, 
and and that's that's what really motivates me. Now, if the government is somehow manipulating and and monitoring UFO groups and UFO researchers, that is also something that I find extremely interesting. And if they're doing it for whatever reason, I find that to be a fascinating, a fascinating situation. Closing a question, Tom, what's at stake here if we don't find out what's actually going on? I feel, Larry, that the UFO problem is a very difficult problem. It's a long-term issue. It's been going on in the modern era since 1947. We still don't have the answers that we would like to have. I believe that this field requires patience and that it requires a tolerance for ambiguity. In dealing with, with government issues, in some ways, it's like the proverbial wilderness of mirrors. It is a maze. It's a labyrinth of information. So I think that we have to be patient. We have to have a long-term perspective, and we need to have a tolerance for ambiguity. In other words, we can't be so impatient that we expect black and white definitive answers. In my opinion, the most that we can hope for is to learn more, and that's what I'm trying to do. Tom Whitmore of MUFON, a well-known uh, researcher of uh, UFOs and what's behind it, what's involved, and what it means to us. Thanks very much for being with us, and we'd like to have you back again soon. Thank you, Larry. I'm really excited to be here, and I hope to, to see you again sometime. All right, Tom. Thanks very much.